Hi everyone, this is Steve Gorn. I'm here with my partner Laura Duncan. Um, we're, we're delighted that you're here to join us for today's webinar, Fiduciary Income Tax Refresher and Update 2022. Uh, before we begin, we want to cover a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen. We will try to answer these during the webcast, but if a full, fuller answer is needed, or we run out of time, it will be answered later via email. Uh, but most likely, we have such a jam-packed agenda that, that that I'll probably just try to answer them in the um, in the in the chat uh, rather than orally. So, so uh, take a look at that and be sure to use your Q and A which if you have questions. And, and to, you can always uh, email us afterwards if we don't get to your questions and we haven't responded yet. Okay, a copy of. Today's slides, as well as other reference materials, are available in the resource widget. You can find answers to some common technical questions located in the help widget at the bottom of your screen. This webinar is CLE accredited in California and Illinois for 1.5 general credit, in Missouri for 1.8 general credit, and 1.5 general credit in Texas, which is pending, and in New York, 1.5 general experienced and 1.5 general transitional. Um, we award CLE based on attendance for the entire 90 minutes. From time to time, a pop-up screen will appear asking you to select a secret word. Uh, so that's not Pop-Tarts, that's a pop-up screen. Simply select the word and click Submit. Our system will capture your response. The certification icon located at the bottom of the screen will only tell you if you've met our criteria for awarding CLE. It does not include the certificate of attendance. Once you have verified your attendance, your certificate will be emailed to you later. This webinar is being recorded and will be available within 24 hours. You can access it from our website, www.thompsoncoburn.com. All in attendance will also receive a link to the recording. Please do not hesitate to share it with other professionals who may find it use useful. And of course, if certain parts stand out, then they can fast forward to recording to those Part. We value your opinions and appreciate the participation in the course. Okay, so on on today to today's um, topics. So uh, we have the slides, and we we will try to cover them, but we will probably wind up skipping over some. So we'll see how that goes. Um, a, a few thousand page PDF, which is uh, in my quarterly new, you can always get the most recent version from my quarterly newsletter. Uh, and um, and then I have instructions here on the slide on how to navigate between the slides and the big PDF. And I'm not gonna go in detail through those uh, through those instructions, they're just there for your for your reference. Okay, so today we're going to talk about strategic income tax planning. We're going to talk about documentation to avoid the multiple trust rule. We'll talk about state fiduciary income taxation, uh, discretionary distributions in the first 65 days of a taxable year, which is almost up. We've got three more days, um, including how to make such a distribution carry out the capital gain. We'll also talk about minimizing liability for the trustee and the tax return preparer. Um, and we'll, we'll close with a, a kind of a new topic this year, tax issues regarding annuities and life insurance held in trust. So Laura? Okay, so um, I guess I'll start by telling you that you'll see on this slide, there is a reference at the top, the 2.J.4, that's referring to the supporting materials that Steve talked about. So when you see those references at the top, you can always go and get additional backup information and sites, et cetera. So it's a good cross-reference for you on these. So today I was going to start with some tips for fiduciary income tax preparers since it's a time when we're all working on these returns. And as Steve said, the 65-day rule is just about ready to expire. So if you're going to do something, now's the time to do it. So here's uh, a few tips for you as you're working on the fiduciary income tax returns. Look at the beneficiary's residence. 
As you may know, the, the, a change in a beneficiary's residence can change the state income tax ramifications. Distributions after year end to carry out income. So that's the 65 day rule. So you can make a distribution after your year end and carry out that income to the beneficiary. We're gonna be talking about capital gain elections and ways that um, you could carry out capital gains to the beneficiary rather than trapping them in the trust. Charitable distributions, um, you may want to think about those. If you make them in the current year, they can count for the current year or the previous tax year. And finally, um, material participation for, for purposes of the NEAT tax. Um, the NEAT tax, the net investment income tax, applies to passive income. So we'll talk about ways that we could have somebody material participate and potentially avoid that. Next slide, we're talking about some more tips. Um, the first two are about uh, making a trust either a partial grantor trust or a complete grantor trust as to the beneficiary. And this is a way to permanently shift the income from the trust to the beneficiary. Trapping income in the trust notwithstanding distribution. So, if a trust were to make an ESBET election, an electing small business trust election, the S corporation income would be taxed to the trust even if distributions are made out. And modifying the trust to make it more income tax efficient. So there's ways that even irrevocable trust can be modified under the trust code or potentially decanting, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit more, but ways that an irrevocable trust could become more tax efficient. And then helping our trustees provide annual notices to the beneficiaries to reduce exposure. So Steve's material has some sample notices um, that could be sent out by the trustee. The key is to adequately disclose the information and give the beneficiary the indication of the time allowed that they could commence a proceeding. So if, we, if you're able to do that and help the trustee get that information out to the beneficiary, you could potentially cut the time that a trustee could be liable from five years to one year. That's under Missouri and other uniform trust code state statutes. So if you have litigious beneficiaries, it's, you certainly want to cut that time off. If you have a harmonious situation, get that information out to them while, while everybody's happy with things. So again, there's a sample notice in Steve's material, and you can put the, this information on a flash drive and sail, send it out to the beneficiaries and help the trustees do that to uh, get the statute shortened. So now we're gonna move on to the 2017 tax law and the implications on fiduciary income tax. Um, one of the, the significant changes in that tax law was that miscellaneous itemized deductions are no longer deductible through the end of 2025, and that includes investment advisory fees. Trust administrative expenses are still deductible, and, and the code talks about it in sort of a double negative. These are expenses that would not have been incurred if the property was not held in a trust or estate. In other words, Things that are necessary because it is an estate or a trust are still deductible. And again, there's the state tax deduction limitation, that so-called SALT deduction, that's a $10,000 limitation for beneficiaries as well as non-grantor trusts. Another change in the 2017 tax law was provide that ESBETs may now have non-resident aliens as permissible current beneficiaries. And it also changed the nature of the charitable contributions if an ESBET trust makes that deduction. So it's now a code seven, section 170 deduction rather than a code section 642C deduction. And that's significant in light of planning for excess losses, which we're going to talk about next. So generally, trust cannot pass losses through to the beneficiaries except in the year of the trust termination. So Code Section 642H1 talks about the carryover losses, and H2 talks about excess deductions in the year of termination. 
And until we have the 2020 tax regulations, those excess deductions had been treated as miscellaneous itemized deductions to the beneficiaries. And as we just said, those miscellaneous itemized deductions are disallowed through 2025. But the final regs that came out in 2020 classify excess deductions on termination in one of three categories that are listed here on the slide, with the top one being the most favorable and the bottom one being least favorable. So allowing an uh, allowable and arriving at adjusted gross income, in other words, an above the line deduction. Secondly, as an non-miscellaneous itemized deduction, which is, which is still deductible, or third, as a miscellaneous itemized deduction. To the extent that deductions are allocable to income, taxpayers can choose which deductions offset income. So it's most favorable, obviously, to use the least favorable deductions first to offset income and try to preserve those more favorable more favorable deductions to carry out to the beneficiaries. So we're just going to go through a quick example of that here. So if we have a trust that's terminating and there's $5,000 of income and we have $2,000 of tax prep fees and $4,000 of legal fees, we obviously have excess deductions of $1,000. These, both of these deductions are 677E above the line deductions. In other words, they can offset income directly. Before the 2020 regs, that excess deduction would be a miscellaneous itemized deduction. But under the 2020 regs, that is now an above the line deduction, so much more favorable. So given the same example, but we have 4,000 in legal fees. Instead of the 4,000 in legal fees, we have 4,000 in state income tax deduction. This is at which the state income tax is an itemized deduction. So we still have excess deductions of $1,000. When we're preparing the tax return, we apply the 1,000 in tax prep fees and the 4,000 in state income tax to eliminate the income. That means we have $1,000 left in the tax prep fees. Under the regs, now that $1,000 excess is an above the line deduction. If instead we offset the income by 2,000 in tax fees and 3,000 in state income tax, we have the $1,000 left in state income tax. And that $1,000 excess is a regular itemized deduction. So you can see that variation one was better because we were left with a $1,000 above the line deduction passing out to the beneficiaries rather than an itemized deduction. So this just goes back to our tips for preparing tax returns. You can carefully choose how to offset the income. So a couple of quick reminders that personal exemption and the charitable deduction under 642C are not excess deductions in the year of termination, but the preamble does seem to confirm that SBETS now can, with their 170 charitable deduction, is now an excess deduction on termination, since it's not a 642C deduction. And the last slide just pulls some language out from the proposed regs, which deals with the applicable dates. And basically, these proposed regs are, can be relied on for tax years 2018 and after. So you still may want to go back and look at prior tax year returns and see if it would be helpful or beneficial to do an amendment to those if when the deductions carried out to the beneficiary, they were treated as disallowed miscellaneous itemized deductions. So now we have our first polling question. So today's first secret word is Chicago. Please select the correct word from the list below, which all of them are our offices of Thompson Coburn, in, in addition to Los Angeles and New York and DC.
Okay, let's go ahead and move on now. And we're going to talk about the uh, Code Section 199, Cap A deduction. That's the 20% deduction for qualified business income. And uh, there's certain taxable income thresholds. And if you're below the threshold, then most ineligible service businesses become eligible if you're below the bottom end, and the wage limitations do not apply. Um, the benefits phase out over the range, and and you get kind of a double hit potentially between the service businesses and the specified service trader business and the and the and the disallowance for not having enough wages. Um, and uh, so anyway, I just we just wanted to show you the threshold so you could you could see how they've they've changed. So. When you have the qualified business income, uh, grants or trusts are disregarded and their items are, are attributed directly to their deemed owners. So you put it in the, in the grantor information statement and, and it directly appears on their returns. So if you have a non-grantor trust um, or in a state, then what you would do is, is you look to see what your respective portions of distributable net income, DNI, are. And if you recall, DNI is basically your taxable income before your income distribution deduction. So basically, you 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 figure out uh, how much of the DNI the trust retained and how much to distribute out to the beneficiaries, and then you just prorate it. So you don't take the deduct this 199A deduction to when you calculate the DNI because otherwise you'd you'd have a, a circular calculation. And then the taxable income thresholds are applied separately at the trust and beneficiary level. So first you allocate the 199A items, then you see how much is left over in the trust, and then you apply you, you apply the, the various thresholds to, to determine uh, the you know the wage limitations and the specified service trader bits and stuff like that. So rental real estate, uh, rental real estate. Uh, is very frequently a trade or business. Um, a lot of people scream to get a, a safe harbor for when re rental real estate is a trade or business. Um, it really was not necessary to get one, but for some reason, some people really wanted to have one. And so the IRS put out a safe harbor, and the safe harbor is practically useless because, for example, a large shopping center or a large office building would not be within the safe harbor, but we know it's pretty obvious that uh, there's a lot of work that the, that the, that the landlords have to do to, to help serve their tenants. So if you want to get more information on how to do it, you can look at the very last slide is a, click to a, is, um, is a link to um, another TCLE, which I did, and, and, uh, and that it's available on demand. Okay, moving on to the multiple trust rule. So you can see, like, when we have thresholds for the for this for the qualified business income taxable income limitation, and we also have, for example, the state income tax deduction, which is limited per taxpayer. So you can see why, if you have multiple trust, you you may be able to have you know break down your thresholds and get you know break down your taxable income to get below the threshold. Um, or, or be able to deduct state income tax multiple times. Um, so, so anyway, um, there's some people who, who, who told the IRS that we would abuse this and, and have multiple trusts, and, and the IRS decided to promulgate regulations. They were totally overreaching, uh, and, 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 and basically the, the, the regulations eventually just punted on it. And, and said, oh, just look at the legislative history. And, um, and the legislative history, unfortunately, is very confusing. And you see there's a link there to Axtec's comments um, in which I participated. And we, we point out various questions that remain based on it. So, um, so really, you don't want to have to do a bunch of analysis on this. 
it, it's a lot easier to just document the non-tax reasons for having multiple trusts. So we know the saying that you never know somebody until you split an inheritance with them. And lots of times, siblings will behave themselves while their parents are alive, but then when their parents die, they're at each other's throats. So one reason to have a separate trust for a son and a separate trust for a daughter is you don't want them fighting each other. So it, if, if, you wanna, if you have any concerns about the multiple trust rule, just, just put, in your, put in the records for the trust <clears throat> that these were created so that you'd have um, no fiduciary issues between the trustee having to navigate between the son and the daughter. <clears throat> Okay, we're going to move on now to some strategic in income tax planning. Um, and just briefly here, these are some of the issues we're going to cover today. Who is best taxed on gross income as between the trust and the trust beneficiaries? The effect of the kitty tax rates? Who benefits most from deductions? The state and local income tax issues? Considering trust purposes and why it may or may not make sense to make distributions out to beneficiaries. Some of the planning we can do that affects future years like capital gain elections and grantor trust status. Flexibility and in income taxation and how we can make our trust again more, more flexible. Planning for excess losses. And finally, the Section 645 election, which is the election for a trust to be treated as an estate for income tax purposes. So we'll start with who is best, who is best taxed on gross income. So even if a trust and beneficiary are in the same marginal rate, the beneficiary might actually have a higher effective tax rate. So we need to really th stop and think about what the effect of increasing a beneficiary's AGI might be. And here's some of the possible implications. It could reduce a particular itemized deductions to the beneficiary, like medical deductions and casualty losses, which reduce um, as AG AGI increases. The phase out of the AMP election, the phase out of the personal exemption, which would be years 2026 and after, the effects of net income tax, um, once an individual's income exceeds certain threshold, the NEAT tax applies. So we're going to talk about those thresholds in just a little bit, but individuals do have much higher thresholds than a trust. Consider what loss carryovers the beneficiary may have. They might have loss carryovers that could offset income. And finally, beneficiary in the top bracket could ha effectively have a lower rate because the uh, income is offset by those losses. So those are all some planning thoughts when you think about who is best taxed on trust income. So just real briefly on the kitty tax, um, the child is generally taxed at his or her parent's rate on much of the child's investment income over a very low threshold. The SECURE Act um, had changed those rates to be trust rates, um, rather changed the, I'm sorry, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act changed that to the trust rates and then the SECURE Act changed that back so it's back to the what we would consider the old rule which is the parent rate. And there is no rule coordinating the net income tax, so there are separate thresholds for children so shifting income to the children subject to the kitty tax could still result in, in tax savings, but just some things to consider when you're thinking about passing out income to children. So then we kind of think about who benefits most from the deduction and administrative expenses are, you know, above the line. They're deducted directly against your income for trust, but temporarily disallowed for beneficiaries. There's the state income tax deduction that we talked about before, which also applies to state property taxes. Charitable deduction limitations, we'll, we'll do, we're going to discuss that because that's a really big benefit that a lot of people overlook when they're doing their planning. Um, then there's also a special rule 
uh, for depreciation deductions that, that allows you to pass depreciation deductions directly to the beneficiaries uh, instead of having the trust deduct them. Um, so I don't know that we'll have time to get into that, but I, I do have something on that in the big PDF. So then we need to think also for state and local income tax. So it's not just the federal, but the state and local. Think about the trust rates compared to the beneficiaries' rates for income taxation. And you may have a non-resident trust that completely escapes taxation uh, if, you, if you're accumulating the income inside that trust, but if you distribute it out to the beneficiary and they live in a state that has a state income tax, then they'd be subjected to state income tax. Um, also, effective grant or trust status on a trust residence. Um, so, an, an, an example for in, in Missouri would be you create an irrevocable grantor trust in Missouri, then the client moves to Florida, and then, and then um, while the client is in Florida, they eventually decide to turn off the grantor trust status, um, and, then, and then maybe they might move back to Missouri later on. Um, I actually have a client who's gone back and forth like this. Uh, and, and so there's an opportunity to turn off the greater trust status while in Florida, because then um, it becomes an irrevocable non grantor trust while that person is not a, uh, a Missouri resident, so then it's a Missouri non-resident trust. I mean, in, in this case, we're, we're probably not going to do that turn off because um, there's many years of state in, of, of federal income tax that we'd like to have her pay on behalf of the trust, and, it's, and the state income tax issue is not as significant, particularly because there aren't any Missouri beneficiaries of the trust. Um, that's a little bit too much detail, but just wanted you to think about the timing of turning off your irrevocable grant or trust status. And, and I would just say that I think residency for both beneficiaries and grantors is, is a pretty big issue that sometimes gets overlooked and can have a, a significant impact on, on uh, income tax issues. So uh, pretty easy to figure out where they are, but can overlook some of the implications for tax reasons. Yeah, and I've actually seen a malpractice suit for that too. Not, not, not against me. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually against the corporate trustee who who paid state income tax when they didn't need to, and they knew that, 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 that all the facts that would let them know that the trust was no longer a resident trust, and they, and they, and they did they not implement it. it. Yeah. Yep, they missed it. Okay, so state fiduciary income tax, um, in terms of whether state can, can impose it, the, the most recent U.S. Supreme Court case was this Kaysner case. This was a very narrow North Carolina decision, um, and, and, uh, and it didn't even apply to all North Carolina trusts. Only in those circumstances, the beneficiary uh, was totally discretionary distributions, and, and, there, was, and there, was no, there was no way to compel the distributions from that trust during the years that were in question. Um, so, the Supreme Court uh, did not address what would have happened if the trust had made distributions to her because it didn't. Uh, ironically, the, the, uh, the year after the one that was being litigated, the trust was supposed to terminate when the beneficiary reached age 40, so the beneficiary is going to get everything. Um, but the trustee decanted into a new trust with no objection from the primary beneficiary, surprise, surprise, she wanted to avoid the income tax and let it get accumulated. Uh, and and so, um, so even though that happened, uh, even though she was scheduled to get a distribution in a future year, she in fact had not received distribution um, on or before the, the, current, the then current taxable year. Uh, and, and the Supreme Court mentioned that uh, that there's, it was only a matter of, uh, in that particular case, there was a North Carolina beneficiary who never received anything, and that was a trust only tied to North Carolina. Uh, what if there had been other ties, or there's a different test, 
and 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 the court did discuss a lot of different other statutes just to say these are all different than the North Carolina one. So it really is very narrow and applies only to North Carolina. Um, and and then they and then there's a there's a list again there of different states that do that have different statutes there. Um, and, and, and by the way, they they um, they basically declined to say that they would um, about what, what they would do in California with what they call a throwback taxation. Uh, and so I'm not going to go through that because not, most of you don't live in California. But for those who are in California, uh, this case is, is not going to give you a particular leg to stand on. Um, the Kind of, kind of the bottom line is that it wasn't litigated necessarily all that well, but, um, but uh, really, if you have a trust that has no ties to a state whatsoever, and, and this, uh, and including the beneficiary never receiving any distribution, the beneficiary in that state never receiving any distribution, but just no ties, not administered there, there's no beneficiary there. If there is a beneficiary there, they're not getting any benefit from it, then you may have a constitutional challenge, um, but you know, good luck fighting that out in court, but maybe you can identify a, a, a good text case. It was, go ahead. No, no. <laughs> so the, the next case we're going to talk about was is fielding, um, which is a Minnesota case. The court declined to review that case. Um, this Fielding involved a uh, trust that owned S Corporation stock, and it was not disputed that Minnesota could tax the uh, S Corporation's Minnesota source income. The, the real dispute was whether they could tax Minnesota could tax the other trust income when the only uh, contact was to Minnesota was the grantor's residence. too far. So the court held that taxing the non-Minnesota the non-Minnesota source income violated the due process clause of the US Constitution and the Minnesota Constitution. But th again, this was a very limited holding and the court the Supreme Court uh, didn't, decided not to review it. So there's not a whole lot we can rely on here uh, either. And then the final case we were going to talk about was the Lynn case, which was an Illinois Court of Appeals case. I think that the couple key takeaways from the Lynn case is that the due process analysis focuses just on the year um, that's being analyzed in terms of what the, the applicable contacts are. In this case, uh, the trustee exercised a power of appointment to change the situs of the trust from one that was governed by Illinois law to one that was governed by Texas law. And after that, uh, that exercise, there were no other Illinois contacts. So it's just, a, again, a reminder that decanting is a way that you can potentially deal with some income tax issues, which they obviously did effectively in, in this Lynn case and eliminated in Illinois income taxation. So, and, and as Laura mentioned, um, of course, the owner of the pass-through interest in the S corporate partnership does have to pay tax in the states where the entity does business. Um, and and we just wanted to point out that the state's rules kind of vary all over the place about what is sourced to that state and and how you allocate the income. There are different factors based on sales, property, or wages. And so the uh, there is a potential for double taxation. And I just wanted to make you aware that there's a resource, which is some, an organization called the Multi-State Tax Commission. And if you have double taxation occurring because of, of, these, uh, of, of the way they source the income, you can go there and ask the states to work it out and tell you how, who gets taxed on which state gets, gets to get taxed how much. Um, another issue, if the entity is a C corporation, it pays tax on its own income. So that avoids the owner's need to file income taxes in multiple states. Um, and the C corporation does deduct the state income tax itself. So there is an advantage to a C corp there, uh, which is one of the very few advantages 
because normally I hate C corporations. They're a, 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 a ro like a Roche Motel. <laughs> uh, state income taxation of business income. I just wanted to point out that when, that when a um, an entity sells its assets, you know those are subject to to tax in the state where it's located, and and if a basis increase causes a loss on the sale, it's deducted only in the state of residence, and and so it, it doesn't help in the other states. And and but again, of course, the C corp is also uh, not necessarily that great. And when the C corp sells its assets, it's taxed on it, but the stock basis doesn't go up. So you know, a lot of people think that the Qualified small business stock under Code Section 1202. Such so a great uh, deal. Uh, most most uh, businesses uh, will have to do an actual or a deemed sale of their assets because the buyers want to get a basis step up on those assets so they can write off depreciation, amortization, that kind of stuff. And and so when you have that deemed sale um, and you have gain on the deemed sale and you have a pass through entity, that gives you basis. So. So then you don't have to pay capital gain tax on the sale of your stock necessarily because you've got the basis from the sale of the assets or the deemed sale of the assets. So the 1202 is not necessarily that great if you're going to be doing an asset sale anyway. Um, also, the qualified business income deduction is available only in a few states. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I've got just a little bit, some more resources there for you relating to, um, to you know, states having situs and stuff like that. So okay. now we're going to move on to um, considering trust purposes. And so we're thinking about, are distributions to the beneficiaries to shift income appropriate? There might be tax reasons to do it, but there's other reasons why it may or may not be appropriate. So thinking about protecting the beneficiary from a third parties such as creditors, spouses, ex-spouses, and the government, protecting the beneficiary from himself or herself, a spendthrift beneficiary we often see, and avoiding estate tax at the beneficiary's death, although right now with a greatly increased unified credit exemption that may, may or not be such a big deal. We're going to talk about effects on future years. One of those big issues is capital gain distribution elections. So in the first year a distribution of principal is made without referring to or actually distributing the capital gain, the trustee is making an election for that year and future years. We're going to talk about some other ways to distribute capital gains out, but those are some thoughts as, as you're preparing the returns. And then it, we're going to talk about turning on and off grant or trust powers such as swap powers and how that will affect things as well for the trust. So in thinking about the way the trusts are drafted, flexibility is really the key for trust income tax issues. So a support standard, which is the, the word we use for an ascertainable standard, so health, education, maintenance, support, we use the term support. Um, you want to think about whether you have to consider or ignore other resources. So the trustee could be still given some flexibility in determining whether to make a support distribution if he has to consider other resources or may consider other resources. Also look at whether the distributions can be made for welfare. Um, welfare is the non-ascertainable term that we use. It's a much broader standard. And you may think about having an independent trustee um, who can exercise that welfare standard and make, make distributions. And, and we're going to talk about decanting in a little bit, but welfare is key um, for potentially making a decanting distribution by a trustee. And also look at the 5% withdrawal rights, whether that might be included and can make the trust a partial grant or trust as to the beneficiary. So when it comes to planning for excess losses. You can't pass through losses other than the depreciation um, during the current year. So only in the final year can you pass through losses. So um, you, you, you can carry over net operating loss and capital losses from one year to the next, but you can't 
um, you can't uh, carry over other things. Like if you have excess tax prep fees and legal fees for the year relative to the income, I mean, we know that our fees are not excessive, but <laughs> they, they may happen to exceed the income. Uh, and and so um, so those those you can't carry them from one year to the next. Um, so um, there's some if you do have um, some losses from businesses, you may be able to um, use the passive loss rules to um, to suspend losses and kind of simplify things. Laura, the code six. 45 election, which is a great election in which you can have a trust be treated as an estate, and the estate has some beneficial implications, which is why the 645 election might be helpful. It could allow you to use a fiscal year rather than a calendar year. There's a charitable set aside allowable for estates, and there's also an extended time to hold S corporation stock for estates as opposed to trust. So that 645 election, this is something that we see people sometimes forget about, does have a termination date. So if there's an estate tax return, if there's no estate tax return filed, then the election terminates two years after the decedent's death. If there is an estate tax return filed, then this election terminates 12 months after the closing letter date. So here's our next secret word. Today's secret word is water. Please select the correct word from the list below. Okay, we're going to move on to talk about distributions after year end to carry out income. So this is the 65 day rule that we talked about earlier. We are already almost at that 65 day date, which is March 6th this year. So there's just a few more days if you're going to utilize the 65 day rule. And this rule could be used to also carry out capital gains. And we're going to talk more about capital gains too, because that's a really significant issue about whether the capital gains are taxed to the trust or carry out to the beneficiaries. So when you file the return, if you make that 65 day distribution, it gives you a lot of flexibility to decide, do you treat it as a current year distribution or a prior year distribution? So um, tax preparation software tends to trap capital gains inside the trust and not distribute them to the beneficiaries unless you take special steps. And we're going to discuss strategic issues, the law, and some practical issues. So let's look at the additional 5% capital gain tax. You can see on this slide what those levels are, and you can see that trusts have to pay that additional 5% capital gain tax at very low rates. So it tends to be better to distribute them out to beneficiaries. Also, um, we have the 3.8% tax on net investment income. Um, and as, as Laura referred to before, um, we have uh, the, the movie Monty Python and the Holy Grail predicted that the word Neat. would be a bad word. So, so we know that that's true with NII here, that Neat, that, uh, neat is a bad word. So, so also trusts are more likely to be subjected to this tax than an individual. So again, pushing out your capital gain may be beneficial to avoid that tax. Now, even though people think of, of capital gain as being trapped inside the trust as a general rule, it's really weird the, the statute, the actual statute, Internal Revenue Code said that you include capital gain in DNI unless you have to exclude it. So unless it is from the sale of a capital asset, allocated to corpus, not paid credit or required to be distributed to a beneficiary, et cetera. So um, not a capital asset. It's really weird. So the building that we're in right now, uh, which is 36 floors tall, uh, required an enormous capital investment. Um, 
but it's being used in a business. It's being rented out. So it, as business property, it is considered not to be a capital asset. Very bizarre in our tax system that such an expensive, uh, uh, expensive thing is not a capital asset. But it's not, and any gain on the sale of this building would not be would 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 not be gain from the sale of a capital asset. It is capital gain um, to the to the extent that it qualifies as Code Section 1231 property, and, and there was no accelerated depreciation taken on it, so it would be capital gain for that. Um, but but so so that the capital gain from the sale of, of a building like this would be um, automatically included in distributable net income, regardless of any rules we're about to talk about. Um, those rules don't apply. The fact that this is not a capital asset means this gain is automatically DNI. There are three different mechanisms for distributing capital gain. One is this allocated to income. Another allocated corpus, but distributed consistently, and the other is a 65-day rule distribution. Um, now, number number one and number three have lots of discretion. Um, number two is kind of a fixed rule that people really think about. And and I did have a question in um, in the Q&A about well, how do you tell the IRS which exception you're using? And the answer is you don't. You put it in your trust record. So the income tax preparer just needs to put it in the trust records about the, what they're doing, and then and then that's good enough. To do, they have to do two things. One is to put it in the records, which is relatively easy. The other is the harder thing, which is to make your software do the right thing. <laughs> okay. Allocate the income. So there's the, the power to adjust principle. So just to give you just a very, very quick overview, so let's suppose you have uh, a marital trust for the surviving spouse, and the remainder goes to the children from the prior marriage. So according to the surviving spouse, the surviving spouse is very deserving, and the trustee should invest only to generate income. And according to the children, this step-parent is an evil person who doesn't deserve anything, and you should invest only for growth, and, 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 and not give this evil step here any money. And, and so you have a potential for a conflict there. And so um, a, a smarter thing is to invest for total return and then share some of the capital gain with the step parent. And then a, a rising tide lifts all boats. Uh, and so, uh, so you, you really should just go ahead and do the investment the way you normally should, and then you can allocate some of the capital gain to income. And I have a lot of resources here for how you can learn more about the laws on this. We don't have time to go through all of those laws. Um, there's um, the, uh, the the power to adjust is more much much more flexible under the Uniform Fiduciary Income and Principal Act that the Uniform Law Commission. Um, uh, adopted um, in, uh, in 2018, but each state has to adopt it. And there's only a few that have adopted it so far. So get on your state's case to adopt it to be more flexible. Of course, you could have flexible language in your trust agreement to allow you to do that too. I have slides that go through a bunch of the factors. I'm not going to go through all of those with you. You can just go and read them um, for, for the details. <laughs> Now, if you have a unit trust, which is a fixed percentage every year, then you do have to make an irrevocable election to, to whether you're distributing capital gains as part of that. And, and so, so the unit trust is not flexible. The first time you, um, you, you do that, you, you do the unit trust, you're, you're stuck. Locked in. Um, so... So we like the, the power to adjust because you can be flexible, and and not only not only can you be flexible in terms of what distribution you make every year, you can also be flexible in terms of the tax treatment. You can decide um, whether to carry out the capital gain or not, uh, just as long as you have allocated the capital gain to income. And if you have a discretionary trust where it's just 
you know, income and principal for, for so, you know, support, maybe also support of welfare, whatever it might be. If it's a discretionary trust, it doesn't really matter how you allocate it from a fiduciary viewpoint because the person is going to get the same distribution no matter what. So allocating the income can be a powerful tax planning tool. So when you allocate the income, um, you you can again the trust agreement can be very uh, can can be very flexible and and our, the documents that we draft are very very flexible, and we put in there some language at the end that says you have to fairly and reasonably balance the interest of the of the beneficiaries when you do that, um, and that's really all that you need in there. Um, you're not allowed to depart fundamentally from traditional pr principles of income and principle. And kind of a safe harbor would be three to five percent is fine. So if you have a trust of a million dollars in assets, then five percent of that would be fifty thousand dollars. So if you generated only say twenty thousand dollars of interest and dividends, you could maybe distribute another thirty thousand of capital gain as allocated to income. Um, so that's that's kind of a what we view as a pretty comfortable uh, area range to, to use. Um, so let's allocate the income, and again, you can decide how much to um, the, the gets allocated income, how much of it actually passes through on the K-1 as capital gain. The second one is allocated corpus but distributed consistently, and the um, that that's the tougher one because normally when the, the first time it comes up, uh, the, you're, if you use the software, whatever the defaults are, you would have you would have trapped the capital gain inside the trust, and then you're not allowed to to get it out under this exception anymore. Um, so this this number two is it, is one that uh, is inflexible. So I prefer just to avoid number two. But I will do that number one, the allocated income, or I'll do number three, which is an actual or deemed distribution. So um, tracing actual distribution is not practical unless you're terminating the trust. Obviously, if the trust is terminating, then you've gotten the capital gain out to the people. Um, referring to capital gain suffices. So if you're doing your distribution now and uh, and you say, I'm distributing 10000 of capital gain, voila, you distribute $20,000 of capital gain. And on your tax return, you can you can um, include any, any part or all of that $10,000 distribution in my example. So we're going to move on to talk a little bit about fairness issues. We, we talked about distributing capital gains out to beneficiaries, but we also want to think about is it fair for the cash distributions to, to be distributed out to the beneficiaries? If you think about it, a beneficiary might be upset when they, when they have a distribution for a particular purpose, but there's a tax bill associated with it. So if, if that's an issue, then you could gross up the distribution for the taxes to be paid by the beneficiary. And in the, at the end of the day, that gross up could still be less costly overall um, than trapping it inside the trust. But again, just another issue to think about when you're making some of these decisions about distributing out income. Are distributions advisable? We, we have to look at are distributions even available based on the trust provisions? And also, again, considering the protective nature of the trust, a, a non-tax reasons for potentially keeping assets in the trust rather than distributing them out. So when we look at whether distributions are available, we talked a little bit about this before. Do we have a support standard, an ascertainable standard, or do we have a, a broader welfare standard? Those uh, distribution standards are significant in, in terms of what we're able to do. And again, whether to consider or not consider other resources, and, and what should the trust agreement say? Our trust agreements typically give the trustee flexibility that they may, but not a required, not required to consider other resources. So again, flexibility can be a big key in terms of making some of these other tax uh, issues um, more prevalent. So some additional tax issues to consider. The estate tax on the beneficiary's estate, uh, again, because of the increased exemption levels, this may or may not be an issue. And if you make a distribution in kind, it could potentially receive a step up in basis when it is included in the beneficiary's estate. So again, going back to some of the non-tax non issues, the 
we create trust for non-tax reasons as well because of some other other reasons that the beneficiary may have. They may have creditor issues. They may have spousal issues. They may be spendthrifts. They may save today, but might one day have creditors. So again, these are other issues to consider in whether or not um, it makes sense to make a distribution out to a beneficiary. So Steve was going to talk about forming a partnership. So anytime you have a distribution from an entity, that distribution is, is deemed to be trust accounting income. So if a trust forms a partnership and it puts its, its marketable securities inside that partnership um, and, and then, the, and then the, 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 uh, the partnership then later, um, could, later makes a distribution of the capital gain, that, that, um, unless it's a liquidating distribution, that distribution of capital gain is going to be considered to be income. And so you can carry out your income from um, from the uh, from the partnership to the trust, and then it, then that capital gain is part of your uh, trust accounting income merely because it's coming from the partnership. So uh, that is a way to get capital gains into income without having to um, into D and I and 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 actually to be part of trust accounting income uh, without having to uh, do the adjustment. Uh, you know, do the power to adjust. So in thinking about ideal trust provisions, I think, again, the bottom line, the key is flexibility, and the more flexibility we can build into our documents, the greater opportunities we have for to deal with tax law changes and other changes down the road. So if you have a distribution, you can still have an ascertainable distribution for support and potentially give some uh, broader uh, flexibility. We sometimes use the term reasonable support and comfort, which is still considered an ascertainable standard, but it's broader, clear that it's broader than just satisfying a support obligation. Again, you might have an independent trustee who can make distributions for welfare, which gives greater flexibility. 5% withdrawal rights, which may create partial grantor trust status as to the beneficiary can be helpful and that can be exercisable um, by the beneficiary and the trustee or potentially a trust protector could turn that on and off before a, a tax year begins. Particularly, for example, if, if a beneficiary might have creditor issues, you could turn it off one year and on the next year. So using distributions for welfare, um, there's a reference there to 672C. Um, naming somebody um, who is not a related or subordinate party, um, which again is key for estate tax um, issues. You can have somebody who, who is not related to the beneficiary who could make these broader distributions and, and use that to carry out capital gains to the beneficiaries. And also a welfare distribution can be very helpful if you want to decant. Some states now, including Missouri, have decanting statutes, but in the states that don't, a welfare distribution may get you where you need to be uh, to allow the trustee to decant from an existing trust to a new trust that has more favorable uh, tax provisions. Charitable distributions, um, charitable deductions for estates and non-grantor trusts reduces adjusted gross income. This is the exclusive way for charitable deductions to reduce uh, net investment income subject to the need tax. It is more liberal than the 65-day rule. It, if a distribution is made before the end of this year, it can count as a 2021 contribution, but it must come out of gross income. Charitable contributions uh, must come out of tr the trust gross income to be deductible. And it also needs to be in the trust agreement that allows you to do that. So either the trustee needs to have the authority to make the distribution, or you might give the beneficiary an intervivalist power of appointment where the beneficiary can, can direct the trustee to make the distribution, make the distribution. charity. Yeah. Okay. okay. We're going to have our next polling question, I believe, here. Third secret, secret word is counsel. Please select from below. 
And while you're answering the polling question, I did have a question. Um, they've got a marital trust that's silent about capital gain, but all net income is distributed to the surviving spouse. And, and then it says that capital gains and capital gain distributions were taxed in the trust in prior years. Can you change what you're doing? And the answer is that you could, uh, you need to see what the trust will do, whether it allows distributions of principal. If it allows distributions of principal, then you can use that method number three of, of actually distributing the principal. If it doesn't allow distributions of principal, then you would want to see whether the exercise of the power to adjust might be appropriate. And, and if the power to adjust is appropriate, then you would be allocating some of the capital gains to income. Again, you're going to generally stay within that 3 to 5% range that we discussed before. And, and, then, and so you'd it'd actually be increasing the distributions to that surviving spouse. And if, it, and if that's appropriate, if that's a fair and reasonable thing to do, increase uh, her distribution uh, according to that capital gain, uh, then, uh, then you can go ahead and increase her distributions and, and also get that capital gain carried out to her. Okay, okay, I'm going to wait. Okay. Yep, yeah, I'm going to. Okay. All right. So, so, go ahead. Just we got one more item here of, that we've talked about, so I'm just going to touch on it briefly here. Again, just looking at uh, the beneficiary's residence at the end of each year to determine whether you have a resident trust or a non-resident trust. In Missouri, for example, the trust has to have at least one Missouri resident beneficiary to be a resident trust. And it is a snapshot on the last day of the year. And, and again, it's obviously preferential to be a non-resident trust because states generally don't tax non-business income earned by a non-resident trust. So in terms of uh, participation for business or rental activities, you have, you have two different issues. One is if you have a loss, could you deduct it? But the other one, which tends to be a little bit more on our, hot, on our, on our, on our front burner is is that income passive or non-passive? Because passive income is generally net investment income that's subject to the 3.8% tax on net investment income. So you should document the trustee's participation. Um, and even if the trust trustee, uh, even if the trust is taxed with a deemed owner under the grantor trust rules, it's a good idea to have the trustee participate. And I mentioned before that depreciation deductions can pass through. Would you look at the trustees' beneficiary the participation or the beneficiaries? I think the answer is unclear. And because it's unclear, you could take whatever position you want. So if the beneficiary participates, you could trigger that depreciation. Um, now, for qualified subchapter S trust, uh, the, the beneficiary's tax is the deemed owner of of the S corporation of the K-1 items, all the K-1 items, um, but is not taxed on the gain on the sale of the stock. And um, if you, if the, if the uh, company sells assets in connection with a sale of the business, of the entire business, you're selling, basically you're selling your stock or you're selling all the assets in connection with the business, um, then you need to separate out the K-1 between the income from operations and the gain on, on, uh, due to the sale of the entire business because when you sell the entire business and liquidate, that gets trapped inside the trust instead of being grantor trust issue. And um, there's a lot of nuances here, and you just need to go look at the materials if you have that. But uh, getting the, the participation, um, the... Here's a little chart here. Uh, the beneficiary is a deemed owner, so we care about that for the norm operation of the QSST. Um, but when the QSST sells the stock, then you look at the trustee's participation according to the proposed regulation. It doesn't make a lot of sense because only for one day may, may, the, may, may the, the, the trust actually be a taxable entity with respect to that S-Corp. And how do you participate, establish material participation for just one day? So it's a really weird rule. Um, I complained about it to the IRS with um, comments from ActTech, maybe maybe a Ripity too. I don't remember, but they haven't done anything yet. 
Uh, they start on the way they start on a lot of things. Um, the um, if you have an electing small business trust and it's taxable to the tr to the trust itself, then you look to the trustee's participation. So you can look some more at part 2K2 of my materials, um, which goes into depth about about trustee participation and and that there is a way to try to nail this down if you really want to be take a conservative view and get it nailed down so you're not the low hanging fruit. Okay, making trust a partial grantor trust is to a beneficiary. Um, you can and you can see that this is in part 2J4F. You can exercise the discretion to declare a distribution. And let me tell you, a really big area for this is IRAs payable to trust. Because when they get taxed in, inside of trust, um, they get taxed, at, you know, trapped at, at the highest rate. If you can get these out to the beneficiary, then it's great. You can do an actual distribution or you can do what's called crediting. Crediting basically the trustee um, will, for example, email the beneficiary and say, look, I know that you could, you know, $50,000 would be a good distribution for your support this year. Um, and, and here's the deal. If you want it, just let me know. And I'm just, you tell me. And as soon as I possibly can, that money goes out to you. So that is the idea of crediting. Is the trustee offers to do it and the trustee has already exercised discretion before declaring it, so the trustee can't take it back. The trustee has to make the distribution if the beneficiary wants it. That is deemed to be a distribution during that year. Then the following year, um, it's, it's, you know, it's like the beneficiary did have the right to withdraw it, and, and so you have the issue of if the beneficiary doesn't take that money out, then you need to have something like a hanging crummy power type of idea um, and and so you can make this trust a, a beneficiary partial deemed owner, and and this can accumulate over time and, and really build up and make this be a partial grantor trust. So just a thought. It hasn't been a popular thing to do until recent years, but but um, it's it's something that people are thinking about more and more with the retirement plan issues. Um, so so changing the paradigm. So. You can see I have an, I, there's an article that I wrote here that talks about, uh, it basically is an excerpt from these materials. Um, and, and so the, here are the issues. So you can make the trust be a complete grantor trust, that's to the beneficiary, by the trustee putting the assets into an S Corp and converting to a QSST. Uh, now, if it's a discretionary trust and now it's mandatory, then you've increased the beneficiary's rights potentially. So um, n now um, our documents allow allow you to have the trustee convert it to mandatory income, and then later on turn off the mandatory, mandatory income feature. So, but but you want to make sure the document permits you to do something like that. Laura. So just real briefly, a, a QSST um, is similar to a marital deduction trust. Um, all income has to go out to that sole beneficiary. Um, clearly not as protective as a trust that accumulates income because the income is being forced out and there cannot be any other beneficiaries during that, that sole beneficiary's lifetime. An ESBIT, on the other hand, is a way to trap income in the trust notwithstanding distributions. So the trustee, as an alternative, could contribute assets to an S corporation and instead of making a QSST election, makes an ESBET election, electing small business trust election, um, which can be turned off in a later year. But that causes the income to be taxed at the trust level regardless of the distributions made. So one, one really helpful application of that would be, um, let's suppose you had a trust that was in, in, um, in Florida. And it had a New York beneficiary. So if it makes a distribution of a New York beneficiary, uh, that beneficiary is going to get deemed with a pretty high tax, like 12% or something like that. But but if that income is trapped inside the trust, then um, then it, then there won't be that tax. So you if you did this ESBT idea, then um, then the beneficiary does not get a K1 at all. So uh, so New York isn't going to get its mitts on that money. Um, so 
uh, and the ESBT can be a sprinkle trust, but all the S corp income is taxed at the highest bracket. So it's it, um, it, it, it's not it's not that favorable um, unless you're really somebody who's already going to be in the highest bracket there. So um, in, in in many cases. Um, you you would not want to use a sprinkle credit shelter trust because that makes you lock into an ESBT. So if you do, I, I, and I've been doing like the vast majority of my plans have been what we call a one lung plan. Everything goes to the marital trust, um, and and then you can make a marital ele deduction election for none, part, or all of the trust. And if it's only for part, that you divide up the trust, uh, and. And so, uh, if you make it into a, a Q-tippable trust, you can qualify, you can toggle between the QSST and ESP treatment is appropriate. And another, another issue is a lot of people post-mortem, they're kind of like, well, I have a couple of years where I can keep my trust going before I have to do anything with the S-Corp, so I'm just going to let inertia uh, you know, flow. The issue is that your S-Corp income may wind up getting taxed inside the trust. Like if you have a $100,000 K-1 and only $40,000 in distribution and you don't have any way to get the, the $60,000 balance out to the beneficiaries, that then then that that estate or trust would be taxed on that $60,000 difference and taxed at the highest bracket um, for, for the vast majority of that. So um, it, it may be wise to quickly move things into a QSST so that you can get all of the income taxed at the beneficiary's rate. And the materials go through um, various QSST options that you can use. Okay, so for for children, um, if you have, if the, if the only beneficiary, you know, is the child, then you can toggle between QSST and ESBT because you can only have one beneficiary of a QSST. And then I have a planning option here where the ESBT portion holds only the S stock and then you hold any reinvested distributions in a separate trust. And, and that way uh, the distribution of the S corporation trust does not carry out income. And, and, and then you just trap the investment trust doesn't make any distribution. They're all just coming from the S corp. So the investment trust will let you carry, will let you accumulate that income and and um, and let it get taxed at the trust level, which might be a non-resident trust, and you save state income tax. Okay. So the first time you toggle between QSST and ESBT, there's no time restrictions. Subsequent toggling, you have a 36-month wait. So there may be ways to change irrevocable trusts to make them more tax efficient. The settlor and the beneficiaries can get together and agree um, under, the, under the Uniform Trust Code has provisions for allowing changes to irrevocable trusts. And again, decanting is, the, is another way um, that you could move assets from an existing trust to a new trust, which may or may not actually be a new trust with a new EIN. Um, but it is a way that you can include more helpful uh, and more flexible tax provisions in your trust. Okay, now we're going to get into um, a new topic. It's a, it's a little bit uh, cutting edge in that um, people haven't been thinking about this area as much. Um, and when when uh, when we had in, in last year, uh, and, and and President Biden wanted to have capital gains taxed at ordinary income rates, and and then we have a lot of trusts that have a lot of dividend income, and so then those would be taxed at the highest rate. So we were looking at potentially massive increases in tax rates for accumulated income inside a trust. So I started doing some more thinking, and and I was thought a little bit more about tax deferred annuities. Now, throughout my career, most of the time when I see somebody suggest a tax deferred annuity, uh, I have a one word response. And that one word response is, ugh. And, and 
Annuities defer tax on the turnover, but they convert all the inside build-up investments into ordinary income. And and we're going to go through some a little bit of discussion and say how you can ameliorate that that issue of the ordinary income, uh, and and so you can uh, maybe kind of get the best of both worlds, um, avoid current taxation, and then make the future taxation be lower. So. Um, uh, we had a 2020 private letter ruling that the insurance industry um, got that that describes IRS's view of non-grantor and grantor trust owning owning annuities, and um, so so uh, enough, so so we're going to go through that just a little bit too. Now, life insurance is better than annuities from an income tax viewpoint, um, but if the beneficiary's life is the is insured. There may be some potentially challenging issues. It really depends on how conservative you are uh, about those issues. So um, I'm not going to I'm not going to take spend a lot of time on each of these things, but um, but I just want to refer to you on the, on, the, on the slide where things are in my material. There is a provision that says that um, the only one who can get a tax deferral on annuity is a natural person. So you would think, oh. Well, that's, if it's a grantor trust, then you're okay, but if it's a non-grantor trust, then no way will it work. Uh, but the legislative history um, is very, very um, taxpayer-friendly in this area, and, and you actually can have a non-grantor trust hold an annuity in many, many cases. So, so my, my materials go through that. Uh, we go through how, how distributions under annuity contracts are taxed. There's a 10% penalty for early distribution from annuity contracts that, that you need to plan around, that you need to worry about. That's really the biggest bugaboo that I can't totally protect you here from. Um, and then also there are required distributions when the holder dies before the entire interest is distributed. Uh, and um, most of the life insurance companies' back offices will say that if you have the annuity payable to a trust, you have to distribute within five years. But when I when I said this at a at a, at a speech um, for the Milwaukee Estate Planning Council, uh, an insurance company that was located there told me, "Oh, their back office lets you defer it." So uh, it really depends on the insurance company. Um, so so then I have the, the materials go through uh, again details on annuity contracts issued to grantor trust, annuity contracts issued to non grantor trust loss on the sale of annuity, and then there's a section that, that compares the um, annuities to life insurance. So when we talk about non-grantor trust holding annuities, as Steve mentioned, um, an annuity contract investment return is generally non-taxable as long as it's inside the annuity, but when it comes out, 100% is taxable until all of that investment return is basically used up. Uh, an annuity can be rolled over income tax-free to another annuity contract or to a qualified long-term contract. So in that revenue ruling that Steve mentioned, um, it, it did discuss both grantor trusts owning annuities and non-grantor trusts owning annuities. Um, in the non-grantor trust uh, context, it was kind of an unusual situation the, there was only one beneficiary of the non-grantor trust who was an individual. There were no contingent beneficiaries, no non-individual beneficiaries, et cetera. But what the ruling said was that basically that 10% penalty applied. Um, none of the, only one exception to that 10% penalty applied, and that's if the distribution was made after the sole current beneficiary's death because the sole current beneficiary of that non-grantor trust was the annuitant. But the other exceptions, the age 59 and a half, the, the disability exceptions, the annuitization exceptions, none of those applied. So although the, the ruling was helpful, we don't really know what it means in, in other contexts when you have more than one beneficiary of, of a trust. Yeah, and then it was also key that with, if the beneficiary turns 59 and a half, then, uh, then they you still have that penalty because the um, the the trust is the owner and the trust doesn't have an, 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 an aid as a natural person. 
I don't know what happens if you have a 60-year trust, but uh, <laughs> they uh, they they apparently the 60-year trust is still not a, a bit, is not an individual. So the other unfortunate ramifications are there's no basis to step up at the beneficiary's death, and generally, although Steve had this this exception. Um, five years after the annuitant's death, the, the annuity must be distributed out. Okay, so we already discussed ordinary income taxation, uh, the 10 percent penalty and the lack of basis step up can make an annuity very unattractive, but the tax deferral can be very powerful. And and just think about, um, about the timing of when you make the distribution. So it, if, if this is money you're just saving up, Beneficiary's retirement, and 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 again, let me let me just kind of refer to a, a fundamental principle, and I'll tell you the difference between um, what what I call the American creed. So the Communist Manifesto is from each according to his abilities to each according to his need. The American creed is that your needs will always increase to exceed your means, and um, people saving enough for retirement. In many cases in our society, it just doesn't happen. And so, so you you may wind up having these trusts where uh, they they trust need to accumulate money because they know the beneficiaries aren't saving, and so they need to keep the the, the distributions modest while the beneficiary is working, and then ramp them up when they're not working anymore. Well, when the beneficiary is not working anymore. Well, then they then they're going to be in a lower bracket. So then you could take the money out of the annuity at that point to make the distributions to them and pass it along to them, and it'll get taxed at a lower bracket because they don't have other sources of income. Again, that's not all beneficiaries, but there there are quite a few. If you're if you're dealing with a, a middle class person, you're going to come across this situation quite frequently. Okay, so um, life insurance uh, has has favorable income taxation. There's no tax on distribution from the policy to the extent the premiums paid, and the death benefit is free from income tax. So that's the same thing as a basis step up, and you can do a tax free rollover into another life insurance annuity or qualified long term care policy. And we're going to talk about the qualified long-term care policy in a moment. But one thing I want to point out, a life insurance policy can be rolled over into an annuity, but an annuity cannot be rolled over into a life insurance policy. An annuity's death benefit is always subject to income tax when distributed. Okay, so let's, let's talk about life insurance unfavorable estate taxation. And... The normal rule is that if, if there's incidence of ownership, um, so if you have the beneficiary holding incidence of ownership, then the policy ensuring the life is included in the beneficiary's estate. Um, now, I think if, as long as the trustee is, is not the beneficiary, I think you're generally going to be okay. But there were some private letter rulings when the IRS went to great lengths to, to say, um, Look, you know, what if the beneficiary um, could have made the trustee uh, use the life insurance policy to make distributions to him? And they, they didn't come right out and say this, but they basically had representations made that that the that the uh, that the that the trustee um, could do this without the benefic without the beneficiary controlling this. Or without the beneficiary really complaining about it, so um, it would be um, if you really want to do this uh, and and you want it to be be extremely conservative, um, give the trustee absolute discretion to pay premiums. I think you're probably okay if you don't do that, but it depends just on on uh, on whether you want to be you know 100% safe or maybe you know 90 or 95% safe. Um, so. You could consider a life insurance partnership because the partnership interest is opaque if the partnership receives a death benefit. So, you know, if the 
if the if the trust and another if one trust and another trust form a partnership and that holds the life insurance, then you don't have to worry about estate inclusion at all. Um, there's a little bit of caveats when you do transfer the life insurance that are in the materials, but I'm not going to belabor those here. Um, one really cool thing is uh, long-term care policies. So you can have an indemnity plan of up to $390 per day. So, um, so now, now I have I have a family member who who ha is missing two activities of daily living and needs to have um, care come in. And but this family member pays about a hundred to hundred twenty five dollars a day for the care and receives a two hundred fifty nine dollar a day benefit. So so she's making money off of it. In fact that's how she's able to be in her apartment, but she's making a profit on the caregivers. Um and so 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 uh long term care is good and, and you can have a hybrid. So you can have an annuity with a long term care writer or a life insurance policy with a long-term care writer. And you can get, if you get into pay status, those are going to be tax-free benefits. So you can take your annuity's taxable income and convert it um, into a tax-free, um, into a tax-free benefit. And so that's a, that's a very nice benefit. Um, you can start without a long-term care writer and then swap into something as a long-term care writer, but you need to do that. You know, there's still underwriting that may occur, so you want to do it while the beneficiary is still insurable. Okay. Um, so on this slide, this last slide is if you don't subscribe to my newsletter, then I strongly recommend that you do. And so, so get quarterly updates the big PDF. We have other free resources from our firm. And, and I also do some uh, lectures through um, an organization called CPA Academy. So that gives free CPE for, for um, CPAs and old ages, et cetera. And, and there's a bunch of other things relating to trusts that, that are available. And for those of you who are not CPAs, you don't even need to worry about the schedule. You can go onto the webpage and you can look at an archived version of it. Um, and it's not CLE eligible, so it's just CPE. So it's more just for your own knowledge than it is to get credit. Okay, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna do the thanks, but then I may ask I may answer a question or two. Um, uh, so thank you for participating in our webinar. Um, please complete and submit the survey. It will display at the conclusion of the webinar. Um, I did have a question about um, if the trustee of a QSST does not make distribution of fiduciary accounting income, the QSST status would be lost. And if it's a mandatory income trust, then you don't have to look at the actual distribution, although you can't, you know, you don't want to play games with it. You still need to make the distribution. Um, but if the beneficiary's creditor issues, um, then you know you you might not be able to be a QSST anymore. Um, the other thing is you might be able to distribute the income to pay the beneficiary's expenses, and that would count as a distribution to the beneficiary. So so then you could get credit for having done that um, before the creditor gets their mitts on it. Um, but if there is if there is a required distribution, though the creditor may be able to intercept it as well. So it's 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 a little bit it's a little bit dicey there. All right. So it looks like that um that we have um hit the witching hour. Um I don't think I got to all of the questions. There's maybe one question that's left, but that person knows how to get to me. Um so again, Laura and I are delighted to have been able to have a chance to share this with you and and we hope that uh that, that you've benefited from this. And, and we look forward to having uh, contact with you, uh, you know, throughout throughout the year. And wish you a good 2021 tax season. Yay! <laughs> Get those distributions out. Three days.